many of you have been enjoying the Strapped series so far? This series has been one of my favorite series ever to preach. Uh, I've been preaching through the armor of God, and it's been so cool to see how God has been teaching us what it looks like to win the war that we're in right now. And uh, if you haven't watched the other messages, then you're going to catch up real quick as I read this scripture to you. Ephesians 6, verse 10. Here's what it says. Finally, somebody say finally. Be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. I love it. It's not by my might, not by my power, but by the power of God's spirit. It says, put on the full armor of God. Not just pieces, not just parts, the full armor, so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers, authorities, powers of this dark world, against spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. He's making this clear. You're in the middle of a battle, and it's not a social one. It's not a political one. It's a spiritual battle that you're in. But God wants you to win this battle. 13, therefore put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you will be able to stand your ground. God wants you to stand. He doesn't want you to fall. You will fall. Come on, how many of you have fallen before? You've tripped up, you've made mistakes. Just this week, I have tripped up and made mistakes. But the strength of God is gonna rush into your life and give you the power to stand back up so that you can have done everything to stand. Then verse 17, today we get to talk about this piece of the armor. So we've talked about the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, the shoes of peace, the shield of faith. Today I get to teach you on the helmet of salvation. So I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes. I'm gonna pray and then we're gonna get into this. Father, I ask right now that this wouldn't just be information, let it be impartation. God, would you speak to us? God, would you break up some of the lies in our, in our minds, in our hearts that we've believed? And God, speak truth directly into our circumstance, into our situation. Help us learn how to put on the helmet of salvation today. We love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen, amen. Why don't you look at five people as you find your seats? Tell them, get strapped, get strapped. Go ahead and find your seats. Tell somebody, get strapped. So I have a confession to make. Can I make a confession? I don't like putting things on my head. I don't like wearing hats. I don't like putting helmets on. Anybody like me, you don't like stuff touching your hair or your head? Am I the only one? Okay, I got like one person here. We're gonna talk, okay? I, I don't like, I've never been a hat guy. And I don't like helmets. I used to be a skater kid growing up. And every time I go to the skate park, I'd get in trouble because I'd try to do it without a helmet. And they would always tell me, you've got to protect your head. But I don't like helmets because I don't like things touching my hair. I've always had high volume hair. Can I, can I take you through a journey for a second on some of the hairstyles that I've had over the years? So obviously um, I've got, so I got a little bit of a vertical here. I'm a short guy, so this gives me a few inches uh, in height. But, but there's a reason why I've have, I have hair like this and I'm gonna take you on a journey. So uh, let's go back to college. These are my college days. This is my college uh, hair. <laughs> Y'all remember that phone? That was like revolutionary. The LG flip phone inside it was a keyboard and then the front was a touch screen. That was a dope phone. Uh, so I got the Mohawk here and uh, that, was, that was quite a phase. Um, so so the, the, the Mohawk has kind of changed shapes a little bit. Now it's kind of like a white dude's flat top, but I'm rocking it. Okay, go to high school. This was my high school hair. So this was in my band days. It wasn't vertical, but I did have the mushroom swoop on the side. Y'all... Did anybody else have that haircut? Just me? Okay, cool. Nate did. Okay, are you faster? Okay, uh, next one. Um, this, was, this was like kind of junior high. So this is like every Italian dude in New York had this haircut. So that's what I was. It's like the Guido kind of Liberty Spikes meets blowout hairstyle that I had. Uh, so so let, me, let me explain to you. There's a reason why I've had hair like this. Because when I was a kid, I, I was born a little different. And uh, I always kind of felt the need to overcompensate a little bit. Let's throw that uh, baby picture or child picture up. So do you see the wingspan on those ears? I literally would get made fun of at school. They would call me a wingnut. Y'all know what a wingnut is? 
It's that nut, like, you know, you twist and it's got the little wings on the side and that's, a, that's what they would call me. So, so I've always had this wingspan out like this. So I use my hair as kind of a way to overcompensate. But actually, as a kid, you may not know this, I actually got surgery on my ears. Let's show that picture. I had to wear this bandage helmet thing for like a month at school. So this is where like my trauma comes in from wearing stuff on my head. I just don't, I don't appreciate it. I don't like it. I don't wear hats. I don't like helmets. That's just the way it is, okay? I was thinking about that this week and I was thinking about how for my whole life, I, I would go out and skate and I would do things where I kind of needed to wear a helmet, but I didn't like to put it on because I, it, didn't, it would mess up my hair. I would care more about my appearance than I would about my protection. And I was thinking about you this week. I was thinking about the church this week. And I was thinking about how I think many of us in church sometimes get more concerned with maintaining our outward appearance that we actually neglect protecting our most prized possession. The very thing that is the center of everything in our lives is the mind. There's a reason why there are things that protect the brain, that protect your mindset. And here's why your mindset matters. The way you think and process information is one of the most important things about you. In fact, your brain is one of the most important organs that you have. And we've talked about the armor. We've talked about the breastplate and how it covers your heart. Your heart is an extremely important organ, but you can get a heart transplant. You could get a lung transplant. You could get a liver transplant. I even found out this week, you could get a face transplant. Did you know this? They could even transplant hands, that crazy stuff, but, but they can't transplant a brain. You can't replace your mindset with somebody else's. Wow. And I think it's because the mindset is so complex and so interconnected. It really is a process of an ongoing journey of development. And if you can't replace your mindset, I need you to hear me today. You must at all costs protect your mindset. The Bible says that what a man thinks, so is he. How you process your perspective in life, the way you view yourself and the way you view the world is the most important thing about you. Your mindset is a product of this ongoing process of what you put into it, what you dwell upon, and what comes out of it. And I think in our generation, we have a mindset problem. If we were to be honest, we are all struggling with the war inside of our mind. I think we are more anxious than we've ever been. I think we are more overwhelmed than we've ever been. We are struggling with envy. We are obsessive. We lack peace. We're trying to find contentment. We don't have joy. And I think we need a solution for this mindset. I look at TikTok and I, I go on this app and I'll be honest, it's like a case study for me in the way this generation thinks and processes information. And can I tell you, there needs to be a solution to our mindset issues. The way we see the world, the way we process information, I think we are overwhelmed and anxious. We are stressed out. We are struggling with depression at higher rates than it's ever been. And I think we need to come to the realization that our mindset matters more than anything else. But the scripture gives us a solution. The Bible says there's an answer. The scripture says that the safeguard for your mindset is the helmet of salvation. Now, it's been really fun preaching through the armor. This piece of the armor, I think, is talked about the least, and it kind of is the least exciting. In fact, in all of my study this week, it, it had the least amount of content on this piece of the armor. And I think it's because when we hear the word salvation, we think simple. Like, it's the thing you do when you raise your hand at the end of the experience and say yes to Jesus, and that's it. 
Salvation is just a moment where you make a decision and you get saved and you become a Christian and, 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 then, and then all the good stuff comes later. But, but salvation is this simple, singular moment. And I came to tell you, salvation is so much bigger than that. Salvation is so much greater than that. So what is salvation? If we're talking about the helmet of salvation, what is salvation? Simply put, salvation is total transformation. Complete and utter transformation. My wife and I, we love HGTV. Any HGTV fans? We love this channel. We love almost every show on that channel. Love Fixer Upper. There's a new show we like, Good Bones. We like that show. A hometown, we like that show. Last night we were watching Love It or List It. We enjoy that show. But, but y'all remember Extreme Home Makeover? Yes. Like this show was on another level because like all the shows now, they try to kind of like mimic the way that they did that show, but they don't come close because Extreme Home Makeover was like extreme emotional roller coaster for an hour, right? Like you would be laughing and, you know, enjoying. And then all of a sudden in a split second, you're sobbing, like just crying because they would find these people with these crazy inspirational stories that make you feel like a horrible person. You're like, I'm really not a good person. Like there are people out there like this. They have like seven kids of their own. 15 adopted kids, 30,000 foster kids, and like somehow work at a nonprofit while also running a business and like, you know, adopting pets that have been on the streets. And you're like, who are these people? But you just want them, you want them to have the most incredible home. So, you know, you're watching this and, and, you know, the renovation process is incredible. They kind of go throughout the whole house and they rip apart what's not working and they install all this amazing stuff. They always put kind of like a surprise in there that they don't tell the family about. And at the end, that's my favorite part. It's kind of annoying because, you know, they get you outside in front of the house with a big truck with the picture of the old house. And they're like, are you ready? And we're like, yes. We're all like, kind of like on the edge of emotional breakdown. And they're like, all right, are you really ready? We're like, yeah. And they're like, here we go, commercial break. You're like, are you serious? <laughs> Finally come back from commercial. They do it all over again. Are you ready? Then they move that bus and they move the bus. And it's like, you lose it. You know what I mean? Like you're watching this family, the children are like, daddy, ma! And everybody's sobbing. We're all crying because it's amazing. Like it just feels so good because you know these people, you know, their whole life is about to be flipped upside down. And what's crazy is some of these people have such an intense emotional reaction that they can't like even move. They're just standing there crying, shaking, and they're saying things like, that's not our house. It can't, that's, this isn't real life. They're freaking out. And, and I'm watching them just stand there and I'm just like, go inside. Like, we want to see it. We want to see your reaction. And it feels like it takes them forever just to take a step inside. And I was thinking about you this week and I was wondering how many of us stand outside the total transformation that God has done in our lives. Everything's been flipped upside down, revolutionized, changed from the inside out. And we're so excited about it. But you got to go inside. You've got to experience everything that's been provided for you. Salvation is not just an announcement we get excited about. It's an experience that changes every area of your life. If salvation is just the moment you raise your hand and say yes to God, then yeah, salvation is the most simple aspect of your walk with Jesus. But salvation is so much more than that. I need you to understand that salvation is not simply a destination of heaven in the future. It's a manifestation of heaven here and now. It's total transformation right now. Now, the word in the Greek for salvation is sozo. It means saved, healed, delivered, set free, sanctified, spirit filled. It, it, it's a complete package. It's not just one area of your life. It's every area of your life. That's what the gospel does. 
The gospel offers a full body experience of transformation, but it starts here. See, salvation isn't just fire insurance that saves us from hell. No, salvation is the freedom to live in the reality of heaven. But you have to walk in the door. You have to enter into the transformed space of what God has prepared for you. And I think we've reduced salvation to being this nice little story. But it's not a nice little story. It's a life-changing substance. You can't wrap your head around it. Have you ever just tried to think about God? Like a God who wasn't created and didn't have origin, yet he has always been and he always will be and he is right now. Your mind just starts to break down. You can't wrap your head around salvation, but you never were supposed to. The Bible says salvation was supposed to be wrapped around you. That's how it works. The power of the gospel literally wraps itself around your life. God has transformed your house. He's flipped it upside down, but you have to walk in the door. It's a supernatural shift in every area of your life. So let me explain practically what salvation looks like, because I believe there's, a, there's three facets to salvation you need to understand today. The first is that salvation starts with your identity, yeah. who you are, yeah. which is the great question, right? Who am I? What am I here for? What's my purpose? What am I doing? And we reduce identity down to what we do, but it's so much more than what you do. You're not a human doing, you're a human being. There's a state of being that God wants to bring you into where he reveals who you are. And you know how he does that? He reveals whose you are. It's not enough to know who you are. You need to know whose you are. Who do you belong to? Who claims your life? And you can say, well, I do me. I live my own life. I make my own decisions. Sorry, you're a created being. Regardless of whether you know it or not, you belong to somebody. The Bible says before Christ, we belonged to the darkness of this world. We belong to sin and death, but once Christ saved us and brought us in, we belong to Jesus. What does that mean? In 1 Corinthians 3, it says, you are of Christ and Christ is of God. That means that you are of God. Your origin, everything is tied back to God. This is the gospel that he loved you so much. John 3, 16, we all know this, that he gave everything, his only son, so that if you trust in him, you can have eternal life, not just in the life to come, but right here and right now, you can experience the reality of heaven. This is the gospel. And can I tell you, friend, the gospel is the greatest guard against the attack of the enemy. It's the greatest guard. Not because it's a good idea, because it's a new identity, because you are a new person. You now know who you are and what you were created for. The news that you belong to Christ, that Christ lives in you, that your sins are forgiven, that your future is secure, that you are adopted by God, you are accepted in the beloved, you are anointed by the Holy Spirit. This truth fights against the attack or the accusation of the enemy because it's truth. It stands. You don't live fighting for this transformation. You live from this transformation. It's the overflow of the reality of who God has created you to be. I think in our world, we're, we're, we're trying to find something and we're fighting for success. We're fighting for status. We're fighting for identity. But when you find your identity in Christ, I'm not fighting for love. I fight from it. I'm not living for success. I live from it because I have everything I need in Christ. I can live in peace and joy and contentment. <laughs> Salvation starts with your identity, who you are and whose you are, but it has to flow into your experience. Wow. It starts with your identity, but it must flow into your experience. This is how you live. Look at this, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. You know this scripture. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone 
and the new has come. When they fix these houses, when they replace the rotted out beam that's no longer holding up the weight of the home, they don't keep those rotted out beams around put it up as decoration maybe when they want to, or replace the new beam with the old beam sometimes because they want to change the scenery. No, no. The old gets thrown away. There's no more use for the old because the new has come. And what I'm telling you today is salvation needs to become an experience in your life. The old has to go and the new has to come. Salvation is not just a positional change. It is but it must become a lifestyle change. It must be that the effects of salvation encompass every area of our life. If if Jesus says that I am saved, healed, delivered, and set free, that can't just exist up here. It must exist here. It must exist here. Where I walk, what I do, how I speak, how I interact in my relationships. Everything must be touched by the power of salvation, the gospel of Jesus. This, it has to change the way we live because the way we live has to reflect the one who loves us and gave himself up for us. It starts with our identity. You know, in church, you know what we do? We flip this around. We try to fix people's behaviors before we address their belief system. And what I've learned in life is that my behavior is really just a byproduct of what I believe. If I believe that I'm messed up, that I'm no good, that I'll never amount to anything, then I'll behave like I'm messed up, no good, and I don't amount to anything. But if I know that I'm loved, if I know that I'm chosen, if I know that God is for me, then who can be against me? My behavior will be a byproduct of the belief system that God is truly with me. And maybe today, It's time to stop with the religious, trying to fix all the little behaviors, and it's time to come into a right alignment with the belief system, with the gospel of Jesus Christ. When you're not good enough, he is. Hey, dads, when you fail, he doesn't. When you lose faith, he is faithful. When you're not strong enough, he is. When you can't provide, he is your provider. I want you to know that trust in Jesus, trust in God is the strength of our life but it has to affect our experiences, how we live. And lastly, this is what I love about salvation. It starts with my identity. It flows into my experience, but then it provides me assurance. Look at this scripture. Jesus says in 1 John 5, 13, the writer says, these things I've written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know you have eternal life. Another translation says, so you may be sure of it. This is the secret sauce to Christianity. The secret sauce to salvation is that you can be sure of it. One of the number one questions I always get from people is, pastor, how do I know I'm going to heaven? How do I know that I'm saved? Sometimes I don't know. The Bible says you can be sure that if you put your faith in Jesus, not in you, if you put your faith in Jesus, you can know where you're going after you die. You can know that you belong to Jesus right now. You can know that you're filled with the Spirit. It's assurance. And isn't that what we're all longing for? I mean, in every area, we're all looking to be sure of it in our relationships, right? You're just looking to be sure that they really feel what they say they feel. Come on, I just need to be sure. Some of us, we don't get into relations anymore because we don't believe that they're actually sure of what they say. I want assurance. Sign the contract. I ain't having a conversation unless I know where this is going. We want assurance in our jobs. I don't want to put in all this work unless I know that the path leads to promotion. I want assurance in, 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 in any area of my life, in my future, with my destiny, that if I step out and take a risk, God will come through and bring me to where he's called me to be. But no area of life can offer us this type of assurance except for salvation. It is the secret sauce to Christianity, and that is you can be sure. You can have peace. You can rest easy, not because it's dependent on you. Everything in our lives is shaky and wavering, but the firm foundation of the gospel of Jesus Christ remains the same. Salvation is the solution for protection over our perspective, over our mindset. This is the answer that God has provided for us.
It's a total body experience. It's a complete transformation. But if you want this protection in your life, you need to put it on. It says, put on the helmet of salvation. So we've talked about salvation. Let's talk about the helmet. What does the helmet do? Simply, practically, helmet guards the mind. That's what it's intended to do. It's intended to protect your processor. I was doing some research this week looking into the evolution of NFL helmets over the years. Remember when they first came out with these things? It was just a shell, some of them leather. It was rough. Like, how did they handle these hits back then? Over the years, they've learned to perfect it. It's not perfect yet, but they're working on it. And as I was looking at the newest version of these NFL helmets, I saw kind of each layer that they've built. The outer layer is this hard shell. In between that shell and the interior, there's kind of this thick layer of columns that move. And what they do is they mitigate any hit in any direction and absorb the blow. Inside of that is another hard shell. And on the other side of that are these pads that make it comfortable for the player to wear. All of this protection they've realized they need because some of these hits I mean, have you watched some of these reels on YouTube? Like these hits are hard and it's causing concussions. It's, yeah. it's, it's causing damage. And so they need to do whatever they need to do to protect what's inside because the mind matters. Yeah. And as I did some research into the Roman centurion's helmets that, that Paul is talking about in Ephesians, they were actually constructed in a very similar way says the outside of it was iron or bronze. It was a hard metal that would be able to uh, oppose any attack of uh, whether it was an arrow or a sword or an ax. But inside, there was this sponge-like padding that would create comfort and protection for the head. The helmet was designed to help absorb the hits. That's what it's created for. So what are we being hit with? If we have to wear a helmet, it means that somewhere along the way, somebody's going to try to hit us. Yeah. So what are we being hit with? Last week, we talked a little bit about this with the shield, but the Bible says that the enemy is throwing, throwing fiery darts. I thought about this today, too. I think it's kind of funny and ironic, not to say that the enemy never gets in close proximity to us, but isn't it ironic that the Bible says that the way the enemy attacks us is that he has to be far from us to throw something at us? I think it's because if the devil gets too close to you, he knows that who he's fighting against is not flesh and blood, but the spirit of God, that he's not waging war against you. He's waging war against the name of Jesus and Jesus already has the victory. He can't win that battle no matter how hard he tries. So this is what the devil does. You know, he stands far off and he throws fiery darts. Oh yeah, sure. He lights these mugs on fire adds insult to injury. He does whatever he can to try to destroy, but he's got to be a far distance to throw these things at us. But when we think about the fiery darts, what do we actually think these things are? Can I tell you that the fiery darts represent deception? Wow. Notice that I didn't say difficulty. Wow. That's what we think the darts actually represent is difficulty. That whenever we face a loss of a job, or we get sickness in our body, or we're struggling in our marriage, or are feeling lonely, that these difficulties can be attributed to the devil. Now understand that all throughout scripture, the devil does use temptation, attack, poverty, sickness, persecution, and problematic situations. But God also uses difficulty. Look at Romans 5. It says, not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance produces character. Character produces hope. Another verse says that God works 
all things together for the good of those who love him. You see, sure, the devil uses difficulty, but God can use it as well. I don't think that difficulty is what the darts represent. Difficulty is a part of life. And I fear we've raised a generation that every time we face difficulty, we think it's the devil. But sometimes life is just difficult. Sometimes you're going to experience pain. And it's not necessarily an attack from the devil. Sometimes it's because we live in a fallen world. And being a Christian does not exempt you from difficulty. Challenges are not the problem. The problem is the narrative we choose to believe about the challenges. You see, because God has something to say about your challenges, but so does the devil. And both of them are speaking all the time. Look at what Jesus says about the devil. In fact, he gives him a job description. He really makes it clear what the devil does in our lives. In John chapter eight, Jesus is speaking and he says this. He just puts him on full blast. He says, he, the devil, was a murderer from the beginning. Not holding to the truth, there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language for he is a liar and the father of lies. The devil only knows how to deceive. He can't create because he's not a creator. He's a created being. He can't come up with anything on his own. All he can do is take what God has said and twist and pervert it to try to deceive God's people into believing something that isn't true. So when you face difficulty, it may not be the devil, but you better be sure he's going to throw deception into the narrative. And what you choose to believe about that difficulty determines the course of your life. When you face pain, When you face challenges, the devil will begin to speak and he will say, God has abandoned you. You're here because God left you. God doesn't love you anymore. He knows what you've done and you've done too much. You've run too far. He's completely forgotten about you. In fact, you don't deserve to go to church. Don't you dare lift your hands. I know what you did with those hands two days ago. Don't you dare think you could join a small group because those people are going to find out who you really are. Don't begin to think that you could be better than your daddy and your mama because you're going to do the same exact things that they did. This is what the devil does. But Jesus says it's clear when he speaks. He speaks his native language and his native language is lies. But when you know the source behind the statement, you can substantiate whether it is divine or it is deception. He's a liar. Somebody say the devil is a liar. It's what he does. And he is speaking into your situation right now. And he is speaking lie after lie after lie, trying to get you to believe in something that will lead you back to the place of bondage. But when you face difficulty, God has something else to say. When the devil says that God abandoned you, God says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. In fact, he says in this, you are more than a conqueror. The same power that raised Christ from the dead lives in you. In fact, no weapon formed against you will be able to prosper. Abide in me and I'll abide in you. Ask whatever you need in my name, I will give it to you. Why? Because I'm a good father that gives good gifts to his children because I love you. This is what God has to say. You will face pain. You will face challenges. You will face difficulty. But what are you listening to? The helmet is all about guarding what you hear. Why? Because what you hear determines what goes on in your head. The Bible says faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. That means doubt can also come by hearing and hearing the lies of the enemy. So what are you listening to? Lies or truth? Can I tell you something about lies? Lies are only lethal when you let them in. Sometimes we look at this and say, oh, that's silly. Just There are the obvious lies, right? That most of us don't believe and easy to discount and discredit because we know enough about God. Like God doesn't love you. Like we, okay, that, that's a lie. Cause I know I've heard pastor Jared scream at me enough <laughs> that God loves me. But what lies have you let in 
that are becoming lethal to your mindset right now. You see, it starts off with a small little story that we choose to listen to. But the problem with lies is that lies turn into ties. Let me get that person out here to help me with this. It starts with a simple statement. It starts with a moment of discouragement. It starts with a moment of failure. But what happens is that lie turns in, yeah, fix that for me. Lie turns into a tie. Starts off that you failed at work. You failed at a project. You failed at something that you really, really believed that you were gonna succeed in. But now that you failed, that lie has turned into a tie. And it's leading you down a road you never thought you'd find yourself on. You failed, but now you've embraced the identity of failure. Maybe you got a divorce. Your marriage didn't work out. You thought it was, but it didn't. And and now that moment of pain started off as you're not good enough to make a marriage work. But what that's turned into is you'll never be able to make a relationship work. In fact, it's because there's something seriously, hold this, wrong with you. And because there's something so wrong with you, you can try, but you'll fail, so you probably just shouldn't try at all. Hold the other end of this. And what happens is the enemy uses this lie as a way to infiltrate your mindset. And when you let the lie in, what you don't know is that the lie is attached to something so much darker and so much deeper that it started here, but you're going to end up there. Have you ever seen in movies or in warfare, they'll take an arrow or something that they'll throw over the wall of a fortress that they can't penetrate and it'll hook on into a foothold. And what will happen is they'll use that little foothold as a way to access entrance into the fortress. This is what lies do inside of your mind. You were rejected. So now, because you've embraced the small lie, you see yourself as garbage and rubbish. The doctor gave you a diagnosis. Now you're preparing for death. It started off as one moment, one lie, but because you let this lie into your mind, it is now tied to a narrative that the enemy is telling you over your life, over your future, and you are now attached. No matter how far you try to go, you are attached. You are tied to this lie and deception will continue to draw you in deeper and deeper until you lose faith. Maybe somebody hurt you in church. Maybe somebody didn't treat you right. And that one moment of pain, yes, it hurt, but because you've held on to it, you've let it infiltrate your mind. Now you are tied to a fence. You don't trust anybody. You walk around, you jump from place to place because you don't let anybody into your heart. And the only person that's being affected by this burden is the one that's in bondage to this tie. What lies have you let in? That started small, but have now become so significant that they've locked you in into a prison of the wrong perspective. I came to tell somebody today that though you may be experiencing temporary discomfort and difficulty, you do not have to embrace the toxic deception of the devil. Yes, you may be facing pain, but that doesn't mean you have to believe the narrative that he is proclaiming over your life. Hear me, the storm might be surrounding you, but the storm doesn't have to get inside of you. Life may be difficult, but today it's time to dismantle the lies. You are not defined by your storm. You are defined by salvation. You are not going to die in your pain. You are developing through your pain. And the weeping endures for the night. Joy comes in the morning. See, the antidote against the lies of the enemy is found in your identity. 
You gotta know who you are and whose you are because if you don't know who you are, you can't discern between the voice of the lie and the voice of truth. Look at what Jesus says in John 8, 47. He says, whoever belongs to God hears what God says. Can I just encourage somebody right now? You can hear God. You can know his voice. But he gives us an answer to the problem when we feel like we can't get through. It says, the reason you don't hear is that you don't belong to God. Have you given your life to this world? Because if you have, it's gonna be really hard to hear the voice of truth. But when you belong to Jesus and you're hanging out, covered, your head guarded by the helmet of salvation, you know truth. So that when the lies come, and they will, just because you're protected, just because you're guarded does not mean he's not going to come attack with lies that he throws at you. But you can discern the difference between a lie and the truth of God's word. Why? Because my mind is wrapped in the gospel. It's wrapped in salvation. It is wrapped in truth. <laughs> salvation is security against deception. Here's why. Because salvation identifies which side you're on. The helmets that these Roman soldiers would wear were not just for protection. They carried the symbol of what side they were fighting on. Wow. That means that when you walk into the room and your head is wrapped in the helmet of salvation, the devil will know immediately by what's on display in your life, what side you're on. Wow. When salvation covers your entire being, the devil knows and the world knows. Yeah. Might I ask you, if people can recognize what side you're on by looking at your life. If they were to scroll through your social media right now, if they were to go through your text messages, would they know? Would they be able to see who you're fighting for and who's fighting for you? Or is it so hidden that people can't even tell whether or not you're wrapped in truth. Salvation must be on display before the enemy ever tries to deceive you. Yes, that means you're gonna have a target on your head, but it also means you carry triumph with you wherever you go. So how do we apply this in our lives? How do we use this defense? How do we make it practical? We apply the helmet of salvation simply by regularly renewing the mind. A few months or a few years ago, I decided to go back to school and finish out my degree. I went to Bible college. And so at Bible college, I kind of did all my Bible courses, theology classes, ministry classes. And so I had a few more classes to finish out. I went straight into ministry, so I didn't have time to finish it in those, in those years. And so I decided to do online school. And in finishing out my classes, I'd already completed all the Christian classes that I needed to take. So now it was all the classes I didn't want to take, like math. And for those of you who have heard me preach before, you know I do not appreciate math. I, I, I struggle with math. And so I started taking this math class, and I hadn't taken a math class in years. It was really scary how much I forgot about math. Like, basic stuff I didn't know how to do. And so I'm like relearning and reading and doing all these, I mean, fractions and all this stuff that I just haven't done in years. I mean, you remember in math class when your teacher would be like, show your work because you're not going to have a calculator with you whenever you grow up. Who's laughing now, math teacher? <laughs> Regardless, I had to relearn it. And so I'm literally, I'm, I'm reading these books and I'm studying math. And it was a bizarre experience for me because this is not a part of my normal routine. I don't think about math very often, but now I'm reading about it, I'm doing homework with it, I'm studying it, I'm taking tests on it. Then I start finding myself thinking about math throughout the day. It's really weird. It was a very bizarre experience. Not only that, I would, I would have dreams about math. <laughs> it's weird. 
but it's because I was relearning and renewing my mind with content that I wasn't normally invested in. That's what renewing means, to immerse over and over again. Think that some of us are expecting the results of salvation in our lives without immersing ourselves in the realities of it. So we're looking for God's power. We're looking for his promises. We're looking for the effects of salvation. But when was the last time you renewed your mind to the word of God? When was the last time you immersed yourself and saturated your mind in scripture? I think we're all getting frustrated with God and saying, God, where are you? And he's saying, where are you? I gave you everything you need, but you have to renew your mind to the reality of what my promises are for your life. You cannot experience what you are not investing in. So what does this look like for us to apply the helmet of salvation in our lives? It means that we must constantly immerse ourselves in our new identity. You become what you behold. What you see, what you hear, what you view determines the course of your life and you become what you behold. And I wonder if we're spending so much time on this that we're becoming the image of this world and not becoming the image of Christ. Look at what Paul said in Romans chapter 12. He said, do not conform to the pattern of this world. This world is going to try to force you in, bully you in, pressure you in to looking like this, saying these things, posting that stuff. It's going to try to conform you into its image. But he says, don't be conformed by the world. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you can reflect the image of freedom, which comes from knowing Jesus. The way that we receive the miracle of salvation is by renewing our mind with salvation. It starts by immersing ourselves in the true identity of who God's created us to be. Maybe it's time to stop spending so much of your mental energy allowing this world to define your values, your habits, your perspectives, your practices. If we do that, we can't be surprised when we start having the same mindset as the world anxious, fearful, worried, stressed, depressed, discouraged, but that's not the mind of Christ. But when you submit your soul to the spirit of salvation, it changes everything. It gives us the mind of Christ that has peace, joy, contentment, strength. You will begin to manifest salvation in every circumstance. You got to renew your mind. Get in the Word of God. Spend time around godly community. Get in church. Start serving. Be invested in this lifestyle. But it's not enough to renew your mind because you can renew your mind all day, but the enemy is still going to throw lies into your mindset. No matter how hard you try, he's still going to do what he does, which is lie. That means you have to reject what God has not revealed. If God did not reveal this, you reject it. If God did not say this, you reject it. If God did not speak this, you reject it. You've got to learn how to discern what is deception in your life and look at that lie and say, in Jesus' name, I rebuke that. I will not believe. I will not let that in. I will not embrace a lie that my God did not speak. I know what the word of God says. And so right now I speak against that deception. You got to learn how to reject and oppose the attack of the enemy by knowing the truth and allowing salvation to guard your mindset. I want you to stand to your feet today as we close. I want to ask you, what lies have you let in? What lies have become ties in your life that have chained you to deception? Areas in your life where you feel just broken. Today, I want to pray that the power of salvation would break off every deception and would speak a better word over your life.